cellular service, but you had Wi-Fi, you'd find different ways to communicate with each other, right? But ultimately, when we construct a 95 or any kind of a confidence interval, we need the mean and the standard deviation of the sample. Uh, Hannah, we're putting the laptops away for now. All right. So equals average. All right. So we know how to find an average, whether it's a sample or a population. Uh, one thing I got to fix on this is that some of the data goes off the page. So it goes to column P. That gets us our sample mean. The sample standard deviation, we need the sample. So we start typing in standard deviation. We go to the one that we know says dot, or that actually says dot S. That's the sample standard deviation. Some of the other ones do that, but this is the one that definitely does it. Take no chances. And again, highlight the data, B to P. All right. So at this point, we're kind of done with the data. We know that there's 15 elements in the sample. So we're going to hang on to that information and, and, and use that in a minute. But the mean of the sample means is going to be equal to the sample mean itself. All right. We don't want to autofill. That's the application of the central limit theorem. All right. I know it's been a while, but that was the student T student distribution, the guy who worked at the Guinness Brewery that couldn't use his real name. This is that distribution. All right. The standard error is going to be this number divided by the square root of the number of values that make up the sample. A little tip, use a count function. In this case, there's 15 values, but it could be a case where there's 67 values or you know, it, you know, some weird number of values, maybe 23 values. Either way, you don't actually have to count them up if you use the count function. It's, it's count function and highlight or actually count them up. In this case, you could go either way because they told us that there are 15 values in the sample. That being said, I have been known to make a typo or 13. Uh, so it is possible that I miscounted. So using the count function uh, guarantees that you're uh, getting the right number. So the square root of the n value, the number of elements that make up the sample. And now I have everything I need except for the critical t value. All right, we get that by using the t inverse function. So t dot inv. And you see that there's three options. We want the two-tailed distribution. Now, this definitely is something that we talked about, but it, uh, it's not the kind of thing that you use every day, so you might have forgotten. If you have a normal curve or a student t distribution, and you want 95%, 95% in the middle, 95% confidence means that there's going to be 5% on the fringes, and that's what we're interested in. So this would be 0.05 divided by 2, and this would be 0.05 divided by 2. We're taking whatever is left over and dividing it by 2, and that gives us the area on each of the fringes. But it will be two or will have two tails. What I want to know is what these values would be, but really we learned that it's the positive one that I care about. So what we're going to do is take the two-tailed interval, that's what the 2T stands for, it asks you for the area, the area outside the, the, the middle part, so 0.05, and it asks you for the degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom is one less than the total number of values that make up the set. So the count of all of these values minus one. All right. Now, this, this is going to bring back a negative number, which could kind of screw up our computations. So what we do is we throw an absolute value in front of it with parentheses, open and close. And when we hit enter, we get the T value. All right. So that's the command here. Now, this is all, when you, when you copy it, it's all going to be saved there for you. So there's not really much in terms of reinventing the wheel that you'd have to do. So when you do the assignment, if you have things formatted the same way I do, then it's, it's going to be pretty easy. All right, the low bound is going to be the mean of the sample means minus this critical T value times the standard error. All right, that'll give us the low bound of the interval. So actually, I'll highlight in green the things that we need here. 
All right. So these values make up the low bound. And the only difference between the low bound and the high bound is a plus instead of a minus. So I'm just going to do a copy paste and change my minus to a plus, making sure that I'm still referencing the same ingredients. All right, so my mean for C7, my B1 in the critical T value, and C8 is a standard error. Just changing the minus to a plus. You notice how I didn't take just the cell and copy it. If you take the cell and copy it over, it's gonna adjust all the column references by one. So C's become D's and, you know, I mean, that's really all I have to say about that, but uh, I guess the B will become a C. But if I go into my command here and just copy what I typed in, it's gonna leave everything as is and I can make the adjustments as I go, all right? So my final answer here is the statement, we are 95% confident that the population mean number of texts is between 45.395 and 158.071, all right? And you know, like, the, the, there's flaws with the, the framework of this problem. I didn't give enough information. Am I talking about the number of texts that are uh, sent during the school day or throughout a 24 hour period? Like, I mean, what's really going on here? And how do we define a month? Every day of the month or just the weekdays? You know, so there's, there's definitely some, uh, some missing stuff here, but this gets you the gist. So when you're developing your final project, if this is something that you're interested in, you could, you, can get a, you could take this idea and get more specific with it and say, what's the number of text messages that a student will send uh, during the you know, periods one through nine? You know, how many of these, I mean, that's a lot of information. You could get it during just one class period and just randomize the, the class period that you'd like to get. You know, different, different ways of approaching it. But without having more context, it doesn't really make too much sense at this point. But we'll talk more about the project as we go. Second example is really the same thing. I just have the data organized a little differently. And there's more of it. All right. So this I should have merged. Anyway, so the mean, so average. I mean, you can copy paste what we already have into this and, and adjust for any column differences. But... It's not too bad to do it from scratch either. So equal standard deviation. I want the sample standard deviation of all of this stuff. The mean of the sampling means is equal to the, pop, uh, the sample mean itself. Now you'll notice, because I did a merge here, that you can't click on both cells at the same time. You just click on one. It's the left one that you want to click on. I mean, if you click on the right one, it's not going to work anyway, so you'll, you'll figure that out. But um, as long as this entry comes back as the same as this one, you know you're right. All right. And this one is going to be equal to, it's a standard error, so the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of entries count in the data set, which I don't feel like counting, so I'm just going to use the count function. And now I have my standard error. Now you'll notice here I have an alpha value of 0.01. So what that's saying based on my diagram is that instead of having 95% of the data in the middle of the graph, I have 99%, which means I have 1% left over. So I'm going to use the t dot inverse 2t. I'm going to tell it point, uh, well, I guess zero would have been more, oh, okay. Uh, 0 0.01 with the degrees of freedom, which is the count minus one. So count of whatever's in the set. Oops. Close it up minus one. And now I have that special number that we call a critical T value. And we could use the same sort of operation to find the low and high bounds. I'll highlight the relevant ones in green again. All right, so equals the mean of the sampling means minus the t value times the standard error. We get that number. I'm going to take this, I'm going to click into it and just copy what I 
what I actually typed in so it doesn't change any of the row references or column references because all I want to change is I want to make this minus a plus. Oops, a plus. Now I have the high bound and I can conclude that we're 99% uh, confident that the population mean Westchester home price is between 553848.27. It's okay to round when you do this because we have the real numbers right above it. And also, when they list prices for a house, they don't, they don't include the cents. It's always a dollar value. So one, two, two, seven, six, I'll say one, seven. All right, so 99% confident the population mean Westchester home price is somewhere between half a million and 1.2 million. 1.2, 1.3 million. All right, so that's a, that's a wide interval. But when we talked about you know, what, what a confidence interval is really representing, we, we learned that if you increase the level of confidence, those intervals are gonna get wider, all right? So, Hannah. It's not on. Oh. Okay. Anyway. So, that was the example where I said if, if I had to or if I asked you, which age interval are you more confident that I'm in? Like zero to 99 or 41 to 43? Like you have more interval to work with, right? So the confidence would be, the higher confidence would be associated with the higher interval. So that's the reason why this is wider than, um, than maybe some of the, the ones that we worked on in the last activity, all right? So that's the, assignment or at least the uh, the framework of the assignment uh, I do have